Hello, I want to welcome everybody to this career talk. I'm so glad that all of you could be here. And I just wanted to let everybody know before we get started that there's a Q&A feature that you can use throughout that we'll be answering most of the questions at the end. And we also have a Twitch where we're broadcasting this, this talk. Also, if you can check out the talk on YouTube because we will be uploading it at the end. I won't, without further, the, further to do, I want to introduce Vlad, who is going to be talking about prototyping. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Flora. Uh, and uh, do I uh, still need to uh, share my screen? Or is it? Uh... Um, yes, I think you still need to share your screen. Okay, let me know uh, if it's up. Can you, uh, can you see my uh, slides? I don't think yet. Um, oh, okay. Let me make sure. Uh, how about now? Hmm. I don't see it yet. Let me, yes, now I see it. Okay, oh, fantastic. Perfect. Cool. All right. Uh, well, uh, thanks, thanks, thanks again, Cora, for the, uh, the introduction. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about uh, prototyping, uh, and specifically uh, prototyping as it applies to building software. So um, uh, regardless if you're building consumer or enterprise software, uh, this, uh, this advice uh, should be applicable. And uh, I'd say that there are three uh, main takeaways that uh, I'd like uh, folks to, uh, to get here. Um, I want to cover uh, just a really simple way to think about uh, this concept of minimal viable products, which, uh, which we'll get into if you're unfamiliar. Um, I certainly want to uh, show at, uh, a couple of resources that I personally used uh, in my prototyping stack. Um, and, uh, and finally, uh, for anybody who's going to find themselves working in a large company, uh, I'd like to just uh, kind of give a, a quick shout out to, um, to how I've seen prototyping uh, uh, be used uh, as a way to kind of advance your, uh, your career. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, um, for, if anybody uh, has not heard of the term minimal viable product or MVP, uh, for short, um, it's, uh, it's, it's essentially this concept that, uh, when you are setting off to build software, um, one thing that you want to avoid is to uh, spend just a, a bunch of time uh, crafting this really detailed requirements document and then going off uh, uh, in a secluded office uh, for a year to just build it. Uh, and instead, uh, MVP theory basically states that uh, you should spend a week uh, building something really simple uh, with the minimal set of features that, um, that make something functional or functional enough that you can give it to somebody and have them give you useful feedback uh, to then kind of change what your design or user experience looks like. And uh, for people who uh, are familiar with MVP, uh, what you might notice is that uh, there's probably like a million books and articles uh, written about like different ways uh, to do it. And uh, um, in my opinion, I think it kind of overcomplicates uh, the theory of designing an MVP. So uh, what I'd like to present is uh, just like two really simple ways to think about uh, how to go about designing uh, an MVP. And that's really, uh, it. your design should consist of a single feature that you are the most unsure about uh, for it working as you hope it's going to work. And uh, for all the other features, uh, you can pretty much just mimic the best practices used by competitors. and. Um, uh, and that really uh, becomes what looks like uh, an MVP. And uh, we'll certainly get into a little bit more specifics into uh, how to pick your risk assumption. Uh, but I would like to uh, at least start with, uh, with an example. Uh, so uh, Twitter, uh, before it became uh, this like really beautiful uh, app that, uh, that people use today, uh, it, it started as just a really ugly website. And uh, uh, funny enough, uh, this is, uh, in my point of view, a really solid example of what uh, an MVP should look like, right? Uh, because uh, one, uh, the assumption behind Twitter working as expected was that, uh, first of all, people would want to read just like a bunch of like, uh, like trivial things happening like in somebody's day, like that they're waiting on a bagel. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and they weren't sure that people like even would want to read it. But more importantly, before even testing that people want to read it, uh, they didn't even know if people would actually uh, would create that content, 
Uh, so the way that they went about uh, validating that, uh, that people would actually write about kind of the trivial things happening in their day was uh, by setting up this, uh, this text-based uh, service where you would text a public phone number and then uh, that information would be displayed in a, uh, just like a really simple timeline uh, website. Uh, now, uh, what you can notice over here is that um, they, that, this was, uh, that this was the prototype that they built uh, before they went into uh, uh, creating a sort of uh, mobile interface, uh, before they uh, used any sort of artificial intelligence to customize the kind of feed uh, that they would have, uh, really they just wanted to test this assumption uh, that people would text in their content and display it through really best practices, right? They had a sign up flow that was pretty common across all websites uh, at that time. And then a really simple, uh, just a chronological feed timeline with, uh, with image text, uh, the, the person who wrote it, and uh, just the, the, the text associated and the, uh, the timestamp. Now, uh, when it comes to you trying to figure out uh, what your MVP should look like, uh, one way to approach it, or at least like the way that, uh, that I personally approach it whenever I build my prototypes is I usually start with just a list of uh, all the different features that I want to build out. And right away, uh, I filter that list down to just all the different things that are kind of standard user actions, right? So things like, uh, like the signup flow, onboarding, what an input form should look like. A lot of these things are kind of already proven out uh, for how they should look like and how they should work and what kind of colors and what kind of buttons uh, should be uh, attached to all those different uh, interface elements. So a lot of those features, I, I try not to reinvent them, at least in the prototyping stage. So, so right away, I just filtered those out. Uh, and then from the list that's left, uh, I would say those are kind of like the assumptions that I need to validate and pretty much I need to validate every single one of them through their own individual MVP. Uh, but more times than not, uh, there's one feature that stands out as kind of being the most scariest, uh, meaning that uh, if this feature fails, kind of like the whole idea uh, and the whole app uh, just won't work. And uh, and it usually it's just like a gut instinct, but, uh, but it always seems to be there whenever I go through this exercise. So I just pick that as my risky assumption. And what I go ahead and do is I build a flowchart uh, where I um, pretty much a flowchart exploring from the, the moment that the, uh, that the app loads to the moment that a user leaves my app. Um, I block out what that experience looks like uh, for that feature. And, uh, and for each block, I try to write down what sort of motivation a user has for taking an action, uh, what kind of action uh, they're expected to take, and, uh, and just what happens when they take that action, right? Are there changes in the database? Uh, are there state changes? Does uh, like a pop-up appear? So I try to just write that information down and, uh, and just going through the exercise at least gives me kind of the building blocks to then wrap it with, uh, with my actual software. Uh, and then of course, for for that assumption, uh, I then go back into my list of the features that I've kind of determined as best practices. Uh, and I just, I add whatever features are just necessary to fully test that uh, prototype. And more times than not, uh, there's a lot of features that are really unnecessary at this prototyping stage. Uh, for example, a signup flow uh, definitely is important, but uh, if I'm just gonna be testing my assumption with a single person and I'm gonna be doing it in person, then a sign-up flow uh, isn't really like the best use of my time to build out right now. Okay, uh, so, uh, so now that we kind of uh, went through a little bit of what the design should look like, um, when it comes to the prototyping stack that I've had a lot of success using, uh, I basically look at prototyping as kind of being these like three steps, right? The design, the wireframe, and the actual app itself. And uh, when it comes to design, um, I personally enjoy just going to uh, these, uh, these websites where uh, designers showcase their portfolios. And uh, the reason why I like these websites is because uh, much smarter people than I uh, have already kind of went through the hassle of figuring out what kind of color looks good, uh, what kind of, what buttons should be available and what they should look like and where they should be located from a pixel perspective. Uh, and I just, uh, I like using their decisions uh, because the thing that I want to avoid in my prototyping test is I want to avoid the user getting confused. And, uh, and oftentimes, the confusion stems from poor choices on the design. So, uh, so I just leverage like really common design choices 
uh, made available like in these, uh, these websites. And uh, Dribbble is uh, one of the websites that, that I use probably more often than anything else. From a wireframe point of view, um, honestly, uh, if you're just working by yourself, uh, wireframe can be done uh, very easily, uh, just like with a notebook. Um, but, uh, but if you're working with a team, uh, sometimes it's easier to just have an online tool that you use. And uh, luckily, there's a lot of really wonderful uh, online wireframing tools. Uh, one of them is Proto. Uh, but, uh, but basically, uh, there's just a web-based tool uh, where, you, uh, you, where you just drag and drop elements on the screen without worrying about uh, any of the logic. Right? So you don't worry about databases yet. Uh, you don't worry about your state changes and event systems. Um, you, uh, you pretty much just focus on where things are going to be located uh, from a screen perspective. And I go ahead and build out all the screens that are going to be available in my, uh, in my prototyping test. And, uh, and finally, uh, once I have that, uh, that wireframe built, uh, I pretty much just copy and paste the pixels uh, like into my, my web application builder. And, uh, and lately, I've actually been having a lot of fun using uh, these uh, these no code tools that have been kind of like popping up. Like it seems like uh, every year there's like a new tool. Uh, but one of the tools that I, that I've been loving uh, so far is called uh, Bubble. Now, um, I just like a quick note on uh, on no code tools. Uh, I think that it's very tempting uh, to uh, to just use whatever code base uh, you are most comfortable using. And uh, and I think that's fine. I think like from from prototyping point of view, you know, definitely uh, use like whatever you are most comfortable with. But um, I can say that uh, from my perspective, um, I I I program using JavaScript, Python, SQL, and honestly, uh, I have found in every single case using a no code tool to be just drastically faster. Um, especially because at the prototyping stage, I find that most of the stuff that I build. Is uh, is so poorly thought out and so and pretty much just gets like thrown out uh, that um, that a no code tool just lets me just like really easily um, get through kind of like all these like version changes that I keep making uh, and certainly I mean there's no there's no time associated to like setting up your like different like staging and production environments uh, you're not like downloading and troubleshooting dependencies so that's nice uh, the the user interfaces on them are like really really convenient. Uh, to use and uh, and really, uh, when it comes to like tuning logic, right? So tuning my data models and tuning my state changes are are just so much easier uh, to do than kind of just like like trying to like find like variables in my spaghetti code. That uh, that definitely uh, no code tools um, has I've been leaning more towards no code tools uh, when it comes to prototyping. Uh, okay, and uh, and finally, uh, to conclude this talk, uh, I just want to make a quick note about uh, something that happens in large companies. Um, so I'm not sure uh, how many people uh, here are going to find themselves working in large companies, but uh, but if you do, um, one interesting phenomenon that happens uh, where usually you find yourself, uh, like this, this usually happens when you're in a meeting with your team discussing kind of like the, the, the update uh, to whatever project you're on. And uh, occasionally, uh, you will have a drive-by uh, for an executive just stopping by to uh, just ask a, a couple of specific questions about the project uh, because it's easier than sending an email. And uh, if they stick around, uh, uh, when the conversation starts getting around things like problems that are happening or like 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 unexpected, like like strange things, uh, strange delays, um, usually the executive kind of chimes in. Uh, with stuff like uh, like oh you know like wouldn't it be cool if we could do X or uh, you know I I just got back from uh, the South by Southwest conference and I saw the startup that was like doing this problem and this is like how they solved it and um, and more times than not like nothing ever happens like with that conversation right uh, the manager usually uh, provides a very logical response uh, for why that idea will never work like in this company and uh, and that's it and like the conversation like moves forward but. Uh, what you can actually do is uh, now that you're kind of familiar with prototyping, uh, you can just like take a weekend and prototype that executive's idea, uh, and uh, and send an email, right? Send an email showing, uh, you know, like here's a GIF of the prototype working. Here's a link if you want to like play around with it, and uh, here's some suggestions if you want to um, uh, for how I would do it if I had like more time and like a team behind me. Now, more times than not. Uh, nothing ever happens. Like with that email, uh, you know, like that whatever prototype you build, uh, you know, unfortunately there's no budget for it and there's, uh, it doesn't fit in like the company's roadmap. But uh, now the executive knows your name 
And when it when a new project comes along that's uh, kind of like new and exciting, uh, you'd be surprised at how often your name starts coming up as like, oh, you know, like maybe we should volunteer this person to join the team. So, uh, so certainly uh, this is one way to make kind of like working at a large company just a, a little bit more enjoyable. Uh, okay, so uh, I would say that that pretty much concludes uh, this talk, uh, this quick talk on prototyping. Uh, and if anybody has questions, uh, I'll be super happy to, uh, to get them. Yeah, this is a great um, chance for anybody who's interested to ask any questions, just put them in the Q&A right now. All right, we have some questions about the design tools that you're using. So if you could, I think you can put a link in the chat that should be able to go to all the attendees. And we're also wondering about if you could also share the um, share the flow what what you use to design flowcharts. Uh, yeah, um, actually, uh, Cora, like, is there a way for me to just like share this whole like PowerPoint? Yeah, I think slide? that would actually be awesome. Um, if you can send me the file. I think I may already have a version of it, but if you can just send me the final PowerPoint file, I can post this to our to the Discord, um, so oh, anyone fantastic. can access it. Yeah, yeah. Oh. After uh, after this call, uh, I'll be super happy to uh, to share uh, this uh, this final version uh, that we're using. Uh, but just to uh, uh, just to like answer the, the question super quickly, uh, so uh, when it comes to using the uh, the, uh, I, I assume when you say a design tool, you're kind of just like referring to my prototyping stack. So for uh, just like looking up designs. Uh, I really like using the website called Dribble uh, with that three Bs. Uh, then when it comes to wireframing, uh, there's a tool I would recommend called proto.io. And, uh, and finally, the no-code uh, builder that I uh, tend to enjoy using is called Bubble. But, uh, but I, I have all those links uh, in the PowerPoint uh, itself, so, uh, so you, uh, you will absolutely have it um, you know, on the Discord chat. All right, thank you so much. And now we have another question about um, do you have any like guides, blogs, examples, repositories on prototyping with no code for people who are interested in like getting started with how to prototype um, in the in the planning stages of their projects? Mm -hmm. Great question. Uh, so uh, there's a uh, there's a pretty cool community out there uh, for no code. I, actually, there there are two communities uh, I would recommend. Uh, one is called MakerPad, uh, which um, I think is just like constantly updated with like the latest uh, like no code like stuff. And then there's another community uh, out there called Indie Hackers, uh, which is kind of a community of uh, like startup entrepreneurs. And, uh, and there's been this huge trend of people that have been just uh, instead of like trying to like hire software developers, uh, there's like learning no code themselves. Uh, so there's a lot of like really cool uh, examples and kind of like, like these like, like aha like insights uh, that people have been sharing. Uh, so that's kind of like, like an online forum. So, uh, so MakerPad and Indie Hackers would definitely be the two that I recommend. All right, and we have another question with like the importance of um, wireframing, and I guess how that relates to just like getting right started with your design or getting started with um, building a prototype. Why? Yeah, uh, so uh, uh, you know, there's some things that are uh, that are just way more understood, like when you do it yourself, and I kind of go through like the challenges of it. And uh, 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 honestly, uh, in my experience. Uh, when I get to the wireframe phase, I realize that there are just a trillion tiny decisions that I never thought about ever making. And, uh, and it's just so much easier to think through those decisions and then kind of like tweak the design at the wireframe portion than it is at the web application portion, right? Because when you're already building like your app, you have, uh, you have code attached to it. Uh, so there's just logic attached to it. So you're effectively making like 10 times more changes. Uh, when you like, for example, you don't like this button, or this button shouldn't even exist, and there should be like a completely different like uh, experience for it. Uh, but it's just much easier to make those changes before introducing any kind of logic. So that's why I think the wireframe uh, step is optional, but uh, it's certainly highly recommended to uh, to include it like in the middle. All right, and we have another question for someone who isn't on the Discord chat. If you could just, sh they were wondering if you could share your um, contact information in case they want to get in touch with you since they don't really have access to the Discord. 
Uh, sure. Uh, uh, you can actually uh, just uh, uh, shoot me an email, uh, shulmad at gmail.com. Uh, if you have any questions, then I'll be like super happy to, to, uh, to respond. All right. So does anyone have any other further questions? Um, because looks like we don't have any, any more questions right now, but we'll just wait a second in case someone has some new ones that they'd like to ask right now. Okay. And can I get your email address? Just can you say it to me again so I can just type it as a typed answer to the question? Sure. It's uh, uh, shulmav at gmail.com, which is S-H-U-L-M-A-V at gmail.com. All right, perfect. So it looks like that's all the questions we have for today. I haven't noticed any additional ones on the Twitch. Um, I really want to thank everyone from coming and participating in the discussion. I really appreciate it. I especially appreciate Vlad for putting together such an amazing presentation for us. Um, and I hope to see all of our attendees at our future career talks and tech talks. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everyone.